course, we're here to talk about utilities. We're here to talk about, uh, quite frankly, this wastewater release, this sewer spill that has uh, occurred in the city of Valdosta. And we wanted to update you on some of the things that happened. You know, we see uh, you know, some of the press releases that uh, you know, about, about our here care because they're north of us. And uh, that's really not the case. You know, uh, I spent 27 years in the Florida system and then water and wastewater, uh, you know, working with the EP and, and my friends in Orlando and over in the St. John's Water Management District. So uh, spent a lot of time uh, down here. The border really doesn't matter, you know, to, to, you know, to us. You know, it's kind of a imaginary line in there. But we do want to outline some of the things that we've done to uh, try to improve the situation. So we'll just get right to it. So some of the accomplishments for 2018, uh, we've been on a vegetation rehabilitation program for about five years now. Uh, the city has 40 vegetations, roughly, you know, 37, 38, 40 vegetations, depending on how we, uh, you know, how we uh, are pumping at that particular time. But we went out and decided that uh, all of those vegetations needed to be rehabbed. So we started in 2014, 2015 on a rehab program for those stations. Of course, we had to break it down into multiple phases to get them all done. So we completed our final phase in 2018. So all of the lift stations in the city of Augusta have been rehabilitated. No more can stations, uh, no more section lift stations. They're all, uh, all submersible. Stations there now, and uh, have some pretty, uh, pretty sophisticated control systems on them now. You know, one of the issues that we were having uh, during the 2008 federally declared flood, the 2012 uh, federally declared flood, was that the lift stations weren't able to keep up with the flow. Uh, often, the lift stations are historically in low-lying areas. They would be succumbed by the creek or the stream that was next to it. And in some cases, you know, we have a foot or two of water over the lift station. So uh, the lift station that eventually would just, uh, just flood. And, you know, it, it couldn't keep up. So we wanted to address that. We, uh, we made some elevation changes to many of the lift stations. And uh, we put pumping systems in there that are capable of running continuously. And I'd like to say during this last uh, uh, state declared flood that we had in December, uh, all of the stations performed. We didn't have a single failure, so they all did their job. Uh, state systems. Uh, the system does not have the lift station or wire for state system. We had it in our 2014 <coughs> budget to get that installed. That, uh, that contract has been awarded, and, uh, and as we speak, the boots on the ground installed in the state system. What that does for us you know, historically, uh, you know, this station had a auto dialer and a high level warning light inside. So if someone saw the light flashing, they'd call. We'd send someone out to address the issue. Well, that wasn't sufficient enough. You know, by the time someone takes the responsibility to make a phone call, get close enough to the station to get the telephone number, and then call us and we respond, often it was too late. So the state assistant is going to give us advance notice. And uh, we'll be there. Uh, much sooner than we've been able to respond to the in the past. Uh, the system that we're installing here is a uh, <coughs> system that integrates with all of our treatment plants and our lift stations. So if we have a server failure on the lift station side, the treatment plant server automatically pick up and uh, keep the system up and operating. Uh, so we think that's going to gonna be very useful for us. <coughs> Uh, cured in place pipe, uh, you know, one of the first things that we wanted to address was, of course, the lift station. We were having floods in town, you know, in the community, in the streets. We wanted to get that addressed. We got that, uh, we, we feel that we've done a good job of getting that under, under control. We wanted to get the monitoring system up and running, so we put the funds in place to address the monitoring that's being installed now. The cured in place pipe thing system, that's going to, uh, that's a forever <coughs> project, quite frankly. Uh, we're in the ninth year of that. Uh, we, and there's, there's some more slides to address some of this that we can speak to. 
but you would see the condition of some of those, some of that infrastructure. And quite frankly, you know, most folks who have a, who had a water and sewer infrastructure in place since you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, their infrastructure is deteriorated. And we're no exception. You know, we have some infrastructure that needs to be addressed, and we're currently doing that. We were cured in place and pipe bursting and open cut to replace some of that uh, some of that pipe and you will be able to see that in this assessment. When you Mark say that, nine phases, what portion of your collection system <coughs> is covered by those nine <coughs> phases? Uh, we'll get to that in a slide and I'll be able to answer that question in just a moment, but don't uh, don't let me neglect to get back to you on that. Okay, everybody hold questions till after the presentation. He might be a lot of the questions that we have through the technical. Uh, one of the next areas that we had some vulnerability was emergency power. You know, uh, lift stations, certainly, and we, you know, we keep those things up and running. So we had about five stations that were high profile stations that had emergency backup power. Uh, we don't feel that that's enough, so we went out this year, purchased 10 additional generators to power uh, some of our more critical stations and we've added some other infrastructure such, such as some portable pumps and some other uh, portable generators as well. But these 10 stations were, uh, were very vulnerable and we had a, we had a history of power failures so we wanted to get those addressed. Uh, three of them delivered on Friday and installed on Friday. We're still awaiting the other seven. And they're being, currently being built by a local vendor there in Dallas. Uh, supposed to be talking about the portable pump. That gave us some flexibility. All of these stations are capable of being pumped around uh, when we did the rehabilitation. So these portable pumps uh, give us the ability to get to those stations uh, when we have some high levels in case we've had a power failure or some other blockage. Or if the station needs to have maintenance, then we can bypass the station. <coughs> Some of the 19 objectives um, we'll continue to rehab the sewer collection system to eliminate any sewer overflows, uh, upgrade the facility to the Mud Creek, which is one of our wastewater treatment facilities, and the Wicker wastewater treatment facility, which was built in 2015 2016 completion. Um, the system was built uh, to handled four times the anticipated flow uh, of uh, the city on that part of on that portion of town. Uh, after this last flood event, we found out it needs to be uh, needs to be able to handle more. So we'll see some projects in here to address those additional requirements at that particular treatment uh, facility. Of course we talked again about the state system and some automatic meter and infrastructure which is going to address some clean water side as far as conservation and management of our water withdrawals. But we're also going to use that infrastructure to travel to carry the data from our SCADA system and to the main context. And we have some water initiatives which are down there as number four. So uh, we talked about some of the programs about how much pipe we've done and how much pipe still needs to be addressed. So you can see on the upper left, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, probably the early 70s, 55 clay pipe was a pretty popular product to use in the sewer systems. It was resistant to hydrogen salt, uh, sulfide, and it was thought to be a better product at the time than the cast iron pipe that was being used in the sewer system. As you can see, over time, the 55 clay pipe to the upper left there has collapsed, it's failed, no roof intrusion. And, uh, likely to cause some of that deterioration. But uh, you know, since then, you know, most folks are either using ductile iron or they're using PVC pipe for <laughs> their sewer systems now, casting resistance hydrogen sulfide, and gives you a 60 or 70 year life expectancy. So we've, uh, we've uh, upgraded those products. To the right, to the upper right, you see what it looks like after we've done the cure in place, the lines inside that pipe. Uh, it's been used of time, we're expecting it to get another 50 or 60 years. But to your question, how much have we done? Three miles of pipe 
have been doing those eight phases, have been uh, have been treated with security in place fighting. We got 40 plus miles to go. Uh, you know, a lot of work still still to be done. Uh, this year we're doing currently actually we're doing about 750 feet mm -hmm. of height and uh, just about 800 thousand dollars. So uh, you know, thousand dollars a foot I mean, basically what it's costing us to get some of this work done. So we're throwing a lot of resources at it. Uh, just from a financial commitment, uh, the last 15 years, I want to say the last 15 years, the city has invested $170 million into just the wastewater system, just the sewer system. So um, the last 15 years. So we've thrown a lot of money at this system. Uh, and you know the dividends are starting to pay off. Uh, we had lift stations hold up, and they got the water to the treatment plant, which uh, which was the goal. Unfortunately, the treatment plant there was overcome by the amount of water that got through in this last storm. Uh, Forty plus miles to go. You know, we TV most of these lines, so we know the condition of them. We put them on a priority list, and we're getting to them. In the priority that's been established by our maintenance staff and our maintenance crews. Uh, we have some some uh, projects and we have some plans to accelerate some of this work, doing some of this in house, and uh, that's in our 2020, FY 2020 budget, which we're preparing now. And that budget goes into effect on July 1st. Thank you. Manos. You know, it's, uh, if you were in the south and uh, manholes were being installed in your system, they were probably built with, uh, built with brick until, uh, until the 70s, perhaps and even into the 80s. You know, in uh, Alcala, you know, we were doing a lot of rehab work on manholes, and, and some of the ones that were installed in the mid to late 80s had been constructed with brick. But as you know, the joints are made out of mortar, and that product is very susceptible to hydrogen sulfide. And you can see the deterioration that has happened as a result of hydrogen sulfide. Literally, the bricks are just sitting there on top of each other. All the mortar between them is gone. So when you have a rain event and you have the ground starts to get soaked, all of that flow, that inflow comes into those, through those cracks. And when you have you know, 5,500 plus manholes in the system, and you're getting 10 or 12 or 15 gallons a minute coming in through those joints. You can see for over the course of a day or so, you get many millions of gallons of additional flow into your treatment facility. So to address that, we have a, um, a this is the fifth phase of our manual rehab program. So we, uh, of course, the picture to the left is what many of the manholes look like before we get in there. The one to the right is what they look like when we're finished. Uh, those, this year we're doing an additional 30, uh, 30 manholes, which has been about the rate that we've been doing them. And uh, I want to say that contract is $247,000 or so to do 30 manholes. So we're going to try to accelerate that project, that project as well with some, uh, with some additional budgetary items and some additional staff. <coughs> smoke testing. Uh, we completed smoke testing on the entire collection system in the city of Alhasa. So many, many, many miles. There's, uh, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles of gravity main in the city. So over the course of about three years, the city managed to get all of that, uh, all of that infrastructure smoke tested. The city staff did many, uh, uh, did much of the work. We contracted with a contractor from Florida, Constantine, and work to do a lot of the workforce as well. So we did find a lot of pro problems out there. Uh, 1,440 defects noted by the staff that was out there, out there doing the work. Many of them were clean outs, about 1,200 of them were clean outs, and uh, for various reasons, uh, you know. During this last storm that we had, when we had you know, many properties flooded, we sent our code enforcement guys back out there. They found another 180, 190 clean outs that people had just taken out, taken off, you know, 
flood waters are coming up in their yard. It's you know, a few inches from getting in their house. They walk outside, open and clean out, and the flood condition starts to subside. But unfortunately, it makes its way to our treatment plant, and, uh, and we become overcome by, by those events. Uh, so we try to do some public education. We send our code enforcement folks out. We sent out some mailers. Of course, those folks receive citations uh, for deliberately opening up their clean house for flood water. Uh, many of them said they would do it again. They'll pay the $200 fine and keep the water out of the house. But uh, so we're still doing some public education about the effects of uh, how that the entire sewer collection system. Uh, I and I, you know, we. Uh, during that last storm, the Wipnikuchi treatment plant received about, on a, on a normal day, it received about 3.5 million gallons of wastewater. It's designed to handle about 12.5 million gallons of wastewater. It's designed to handle a peak of about 22 million gallons of wastewater. During the rain event in December, uh, we had 37 million gallons coming into the plant. The plant held up, it, it, it treated the 22.5 million, uh, and you'll see some additional infrastructure that was put in place to address some concerns in case the plant was overwhelmed with, uh, with stormwater. And uh, you'll see what we are having to do to add additional hardening to the facility as well. But, uh, but that's mainly I and I, and, and uh, you know, folks draining off their property, all of that water coming in. The city, you know, about us is basically built in a swamp. Uh, you know, it's a very, very low-lying community. There's 250 locations where we have <coughs> gravity or force main crossing streams, creeks, rivers. So there's opportunities at all these locations to get some inflow and infiltration into our sewer collection system. So uh, we've identified those 250 areas. Many of them are are uh, difficult to, uh, to get to, but we have crews out there right now mm -hmm. who are going to all of these locations and trying to identify if there's an opportunity to reduce the amount of high and high getting into the floor market. Uh, these are some of the things that they, they found. You know, we've been working on this basically since, uh, since the storms happened in December and after the water and started to subside. You know, if you've been up that way, you'll still see a lot of standing water uh, in the ditches and in the uh, on the property up there because of the heavy amount of rainfall that we've received. But uh, you know, one of these is a uh, you know, manholes that the top's been knocked, knocked off by a mowing crew or a bush hog crew or someone. So it's just an open connection for flood water to get into the, uh, into the sewer system, you see. The one on the bottom right there, uh, somebody plumbed their retention pond into their into their sewer system. So they ran a pipe from the pond over to the <coughs> property where they have a six-inch lateral and got a heat connector, glued it up, and there's no more flooding in their pond. You know? so we found that uh, that recently as well. But, uh, all of these areas are contributing to the excess the flows that we're getting. Uh, Central maintenance department, some of the things they've done. Uh, of course, we talked about the uh, lift station we have and installing bypass pumping systems in case we have electrical power losses. Uh, and also acts as a booster pump in case we have flows that start to exceed the capacity of the lift station to pump those levels. Uh, some of our major some of our major pump stations up there, Little Country, lift station there. Uh, you know, that is an old can station that we that we that we, uh, that we got out of the system last year. And of course it's the first one, 84 lift station was another old can station that's been rehabbed and uh, one of the lift stations out near the airport. <coughs> But one of the issues that we were having at some of the pump stations also was our control panels. Again, uh, the National Electric Code wants you to get those things up about 30 inches off the ground, so many of them were installed to that specification. But when the flood waters come, but that's not high enough, so we had to address getting those control panels up high enough so they wouldn't be susceptible to flood waters. And we were also, uh, those things are in NEMA enclosed. Uh, panels there to keep the hydrogen sulfide damage out. 
But what that also creates is very high temperatures inside those control panels, especially when you start to put advanced electronics in there to alert you and control the patients. So uh, we're trying to do some things to reduce the temperatures inside those uh, inside those control panels to uh, so that we can ensure that they function at the most <coughs> So what's the uh, This is our newest sewer plant. As you can see, uh, those four basins there in the middle of the picture, those are SDRs. And that's a, at the bottom picture is kind of a close up of what's going on inside of that basin. So 3.5 million gallons of piece, those things are capable of maximum flow. So and we get about 3.5 million gallons. So, and we have redundancy times three, times four there at the plant uh, uh, to handle excessive sewer flow coming into the, into, the, uh, into the plant. That large basin that you see in the top, uh, top left of the picture there that's empty, that's a storm surge basin. And it holds about an additional 6.5 million gallons of excess flow coming into the plant. So when we had the last flows come in, and uh, we're all here, and we all we're all here to address the issues and fix them. We want to talk about what happened uh, during the last four years. So uh, the plant coming along there, 3.5 million gallons a day. The rain start to come in, flows start to pick up. Basin number two, the automation system there calls for basin number two to come on. So basin two starts comes on and starts to starts to fill. As the flows continue, basin three and basin four are called to come on and to flow as well. The automation there, when basin four gets about half full, the plant automatically goes into storm mode, which uh, reduces the treatment of the plant. It's designed to get PSS numbers well below what the permit allows. But when we get into storm mode, it, the automation tells the plant let us get as much water out of here as we can. We're going to treat it to the standard that's listed on the permit and nothing more. So we will be able to handle those flows. After it goes into storm mode, if it, it still becomes overcome, the automation system opens up a valve that starts to put wastewater into that large basin up on the north side of the city. As I said earlier, that basin holds about 6.5 million gallons. And when that basin became uh, full, it started to overflow. <coughs> that basin started to overflow. You see there to the right, upper right, uh, that grassy area and that woody area, the water ran down that grassy area <coughs> to a, another retention pond that's across the road. Then eventually it's another retention pond. And it's about two and a half miles of, of uh, or 2.2 miles of vegetated area, wooded area, and a series of retention ponds before it gets to the river. I know some folks I saw in one report that <coughs> the plant overflowed into the Wispacuchi River. Well, it didn't overflow into the river. Into the, river. the river's 2.2 miles away. But as we reported, we report that these flows have, have, a, have an ability to get to the river. And that's our requirement by the state report, <coughs> is that it gets through any storm drain, you get to the street to a curve that leads to a storm drain, you have to report it as a release into the waters of the state. So that's how we reported it uh, to the state of Georgia. And also we have an obligation to notify our local newspaper and our local television station whenever we have a, a release of any amount of wastewater. So those uh, those reports were made to the and uh, and may have not reported them as accurately as, as, they, as they should have, but, uh, but uh, you know, we, uh, we know, as far as our part, we need to do something to make sure that those excess flows stay on campus of that, of that, of that work. <coughs> so this is a picture of the headworks uh, there. Um, one thing that we wanted to do was improve the headworks at the facility. We were getting some plastics during that storm, even a lot of plastics, a lot of debris made it through the headworks and into our filter system there and it reduced our ability to get the filtered water out of the plant as quickly as we 
of hope. Uh, that caused us to have some backup into the plan itself. So we're addressing that by changing out the types of paperwork that we have there. Uh, we'll be working for that. Uh, that grassy area that you saw uh, to the right of the basin there will become this depiction that you see there on the lower part of the picture there. That's another basin, a, a, a mine basin that we have started constructing. Uh, the tractors have already been out there. They've already started digging. We're still waiting on a few stormwater permits and some permits from APD in Georgia. So, um, so, so that basin, a basin similar to that, will be installed there on the property to handle another eight to 10 million gallons of, of, of stormwater when we have these high, high, high flows coming into the country. The Mud Creek facility, if, uh, during the recent storm, the Mud Creek facility held up pretty well. Uh, for the folks that are, uh, that have taken tours up there, uh, there was a spill there in, uh, in June, July time frame, I want to say. And again, it was reported as a sewer spill. Well, it really wasn't a sewer spill. It was a relief from our clarifiers. When the water leaves our clarifiers goes to final disinfection and UV, it was a spill there in the clarifier. So it was treated water, it was clean water, and it was treated water. It needed to go through our lab process of UV disinfection. Of course, we did test the water before, and even before it went through the UV, it met the requirement to be discharged and to have our, have our outfall. So uh, but we wanted to get that information out. I know some folks may have questions about some spills that we've had some of our This facility also handles about 3 million gallons a day of wastewater. And again, it's designed to handle about 12 million gallons of wastewater. During the storm, the flows went up to about 8 million gallons a day here. Some other things that we've done at our treatment facility. Uh, power is always an, 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 an issue or concern. You know, wastewater treatment, just in general, it's used a lot of power, very, uh, very intensive requirement. Uh, we didn't want to be dependent. Right now, the state requires us to have backup generation or power <laughs> from two separate power feeds coming into the facility. So if one power feed goes down from the substation, you have another power system that's capable of running your power facility. But we have that in both treatment facilities, but we wanted to go a step farther. Now we wanted to, uh, we, want, we think it's the right thing to do to get as green as you can with all, with all of our power consumption and reduce our footprint. So we installed solar panel systems at both treatment facilities that are capable of running the plant. So, in the event that we have a hurricane that comes through and our power grid is down, during the daylight hours, you know, we're going to uh, operate the plant, run it hard, get as much flow out of there as possible, and possibly try to empty the plant out. Of course, during the night, if we still don't have power and we don't have generation there, then we'll just be storing during the, uh, during the night hours and the power will come back up the next day and treat as much of it. But it's just another opportunity to enforce the heart in the system and uh, ensure that it functions in the worst possible condition. Some of the rain events, uh, this was a 12 hour peak at the amount of rain from, I want to say this, one, this was from 11 p.m. on December the 2nd till uh, 11 a.m. on December the 3rd. And you can see some of the quantities that were recorded uh, of rainfall that happened. Uh, during, in, the, in the incorporated limits of the city of Hot Austin, uh, 5.7 billion gallons, billion of the gallons of water fell in the, just in the corporate, incorporated limits of the city. So a ton of water, uh, most of the city was uh, overcome at some point by flood water. And, uh, as a result, most, a lot of that flood water uh, made it to the treatment plant through I&I, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I also did a calculation, that, uh, 
crossing from the U.S. to the <coughs> right there, the bridge between Florida and Georgia there, and uh, 600 billion gallons of water flowed under the bridge there. All right, uh, that's kind of it. Uh, just wanted to update you on what we've done and what some of the plans are and uh, answer any questions that folks may have.
you know, rehabilitated about approximately 185. There's 5,500 still to be done. That's going to take you 183 years to yeah, do that. Absolutely. You're never done. You're never done in the utility business. You're never done building. You're never done repairing. You're never, you're always, it's, you know, you're always playing catch up. But one thing we left, uh, I thought I was fine. I don't know see it. But one of the things we want to do to try to address that manhole issue is the equipment itself to do the rehabilitation is about $4 million. So we put that in the budget. And we believe internally we can get about $100,000 if we do it in house as opposed to the contractors. <coughs> Excuse okay. me. Five years. Yeah. I guess my, my question is this. Yeah. Is for the resources here and how what's happening in Georgia, we're all interconnected. Yeah. And and the impact that it's having on the businesses in Florida, if I'm a bit not not only economically, <clears throat> but the impact that it's having on our resources when these spills happen. And if I'm a business owner along with Santa Fe or Swanee or with any of these rivers, when there's a spill, it's a real economic impact to these business owners. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, to be quite frank, if you were a private company, you would be shut down. With this kind of, with this kind of track record, you would be shut down and out of business because you couldn't afford the fines and the penalties that the state would put on you. And I don't understand how a public utility or government agency is held to a different standard than a private business. And and like I said, I'm appreciative, and I, I get it. It's a lot of money, and I don't know where the money is going to come from, but I think maybe don't need to reevaluate because it's having a real impact in Florida. Yeah, and uh, you know, and I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I hear you, and uh, you know, we've heard that before that the impact that it's having on Florida, you guys don't care about, or you're not concerned about, or you don't understand. Uh, you know, but but you know, there's no, you know, we have an economic. Impact as well. The Whipple Creek sure. runs through sure. runs through Lowndes County on its way to Florida. So uh, you know we're you know, we're concerned about that. We're just in Fort Street, and I think that uh, you know, we've made some significant significant steps to make sure that uh, they would address those. Go ahead. Let me ask you a question. When, we, when, when you have the spill and it's reported as a spill. Is there actual sample taken of what goes in? I mean, you say 2.2 miles from the river, and there's some holding area there, of course, I'm sure there's lots of, I, I, don't, I suspect there's lots of low area that's already got a ton of water in it when that water is built. Do you know what actually gets into to the river and what kind of condition that water is in? Is, is it, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to uh, make it insignificant, but is it as dense when you when you say there's a spill into the Withlacoochee, mm -hmm. If that's all you say, that sounds bad. That's right. You know that sounds. It bad. is bad. And and so how bad is it? I mean, yeah. is it is it as bad as we take it, or is it how bad is it? Well, you know, we got the sample data. And what's required of us <coughs> is anytime we have or we report release. Into a, into a stream of a body of water. We have, to re, we have to sample one year, 365 days. We have to sample that, and of course we have all that data, and we've reported it. We also report to the Department of Health in Florida so that they can make their test. And they would have that data as well, as what, what how has the water quality changed as it, as it, relates, to, as it relates to what happened in the hospital. Now, I don't want us to say to you and say this and this, but the data itself, the scientific data, suggests that uh, the colonies are significantly reduced by the time they switch from. So we test, so we test the Wuslikuchi before it gets to the city of Alaska, north of us. We test at our treatment facility where, uh, where the alcohol is, and we test south at the south side of town when it gets ready to exit. And we also test at the state line, at the Florida Georgia state line. So we have all that data, and uh, the numbers suggest that uh, that's just a little bit bad. But that's the, that's the numbers. I don't want to say 
there in the area with no impact. But if you look at the data that, uh, that's available, the lab laboratory data from us, from <coughs> third party, from the Florida Department of Health, uh, you know, those numbers are there. I guess as a person on the river myself, it, I mean, it matters, but you don't want to swim in a little sewage or a lot of sewage either. Both of it's bad. Yeah. And a spill is bad. Yeah. And, and I don't know the answer, except maybe y'all go to the Georgia legislature and, and lobby for more money. I, I don't know. Or, or USDA. No, We've got no. a lot of pull at USDA right now, so maybe <laughs> you can get some help there. And, but we have got to do something that reduces these spills and not eliminate them if possible. And yeah. we can't wait 200 years to do it. What's that going to do to our rivers? The, um, you know, the impact of, 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 the, of those fields and what the rehab of, of, uh, of doing all this work is going to be, I think you're going to see a significant improvement. With, because we say that we have 5,000 manholes that need to be addressed, that need to be looked at. So we didn't just go out and sporadically say, I'm going to do that one, that one, that one, that one. We took the ones that were in the worst shape. So this one made, one example, this one may be contributing 5%, 6%, 7%, and this one, that's also bad, maybe a, a quarter of a percent. You know, so, although it needs to be addressed, it doesn't have the same impact. You know, those 55, doing, doing 200 it may have a greater impact than doing those 45. So I'm assuming the triage needs some way to say, this, these are the worst, they need to be addressed first. Also, not, and also the same address. It's on the same goes with the with the curing uh, place pipe. And if I understand correctly, the, the reason why you were overwhelmed was probably <coughs> because of some of these manholes, and you're putting so much more water into your system. And but you're going to add more uh, storage with you know that outside storage area really you have. Is that going to alleviate what you think will be, if in other words, if you had another event like the one in December the second, would you be able to handle it? At least store that water? You know, we'd be able to handle it better. You know, December the second and third is unprecedented for the water ball. I just asked, would it handle yeah. that? Yeah, <laughs> it, would, it, would, it, would, it, would, it would most likely handle that. You know, we, we released, and, and another thing, we reported that we released you know, 10 million gallons. But, Ten million gallons of sewer didn't come to the plant. You know, during normal day, you wouldn't get ten million gallons. And I don't think people decided to use the restroom more than training. You know, this is what came through the pipe. This is what we reported. It came through our flow. But yeah, we'd be we'd be in a much better position to handle that once this pond is uh, once this pond. Is because you know, based on I was doing the math too. Based on what you're looking at, I mean, you're not going to. <coughs> You're not going to get there to, to decrease that intake, so you've got to have more storage. And I would think, just from what I've heard, heard you say, from a standpoint of just pure financial, it's cheaper to build more storage to hold that than it is to try to do all this stuff and get it too fast, you know, cause hundreds of more millions of dollars yeah. to be spent. I mean, I understand and I, I appreciate, first of all, I appreciate you being here. You know, and, and explain this, and I, you know, and I think everything is important. But I, and, and sometimes, you know, when we scream wolf, the wolf sounds like it's right at our door. And I'm like, Virginia, you know, a little bit back, you know, but, you know, how, how bad is it? How can we, how can we take it down or not? And what I really feel, even, sounds like maybe that our, probably the environment is not uh, affected as much as it is the businesses sometimes because it sounds maybe worse than it is and but it doesn't matter when they don't come and, and so I, I think all of that is important including you know even a little bit but you know we're going to have issues from time to time that overpower even our natural systems you know so I, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate what you said today. And I, I hope that we can store enough water that even in any, I don't know what 
That was loud enough at the back. Maybe a 500 year event that went on. You know, but it seems like our 200 year events are happening about every 50 years. You know, now our 500 year events are maybe happening about 30 years. So, so I don't know exactly how to put all this into context anymore because we keep hearing these things. No. But uh, one more time, I do appreciate you being here uh, and, and, you know, at least having some dialogue with us. Yeah, I think this is, and I appreciate you having our, our staff. And those folks that's actually been up there and seen what's going on, hopefully we can get a better, uh, a better handle on all this, and we can subside these these, these problems. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing, you know, as a final note, I, I'll, 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 I'll still answer some more questions in the long, but I mean, if nothing else comes out of this. You know, the the I mean, I want everyone to know that you know we hear what you're saying. You know, we care about what's happening, and we're going to do something to address it. And, you know, the pond and the, all of this infrastructure work is going to take forever to do. It's going to take 50, you know, centuries to do, you know, half century, decades. The pond really is the short fix to say that if it rains next Friday, we're going to keep a lot of it on site. But the long fix is to get this other infrastructure fixed so that that never makes it to the free house. I think your short term, is what you know it's going to take so long and you got so much there's so much legacy stuff there that's going to one thing that i would like to ask you you mentioned the fact that you're waiting on the permit you just get that bond done uh, you 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 you, you apply the permit from the, from the state of georgia is that what you've done yes and is there anybody dragging their feet or what's going on with that what's your outlook on getting those permits done what i'm hoping when i leave here today i'm driving to atlanta I am here. So I'm hoping, yeah, we, are, we might see each other downtown. Yeah. But I'm hoping that we will, we have a meeting with them tomorrow. And uh, <coughs> that's all I'm to Okay, because it that, that's an urgent thing that needs to be done, for sure. Um, but I guess I guess another question I have for you is, is you, you compared your experience to what you experienced in Florida and working for St. John's Board of Minister District and O'Cal and everything else. But I guess my, my question is, is in, in relation to other cities in Georgia, does Waycross, Bainbridge, Thomasville, Tifton, Moultrie, uh, any other medium-sized city like Valdosta is in Georgia, are they having the same kind of infrastructure problems as well? Yes, they're having similar problems. We had that conversation with EPD, uh, you know, when we were having these events, you know, doing this last rain event. Are we always, you know, are we that bad? You know, or is it, uh, or is it uh, are these uh, issues affecting other communities? and? And uh, they assured us that there was other folks that were struggling as well, not to uh, not to minimize what we do, but uh, but we just wanted to be sure that what we're doing, we're heading in the right direction. We we're not that far behind everyone else. But yeah, those other communities, Thomasville, Albany, you know, many of them are struggling as well. Uh, one advantage that they have that Alaska doesn't have is their proximity to some of the rivers and and uh, some of that. You know, uh, what's interesting to me is, is we've just gone through a campaign season where we, Florida and Georgia, has changed our executive, our chief executive out. Mm -hmm. And it was, both both campaigns were difficult <coughs> and, and uh, contentious. Mm -hmm. But I don't ever remember anybody on either side of the state line talking about infrastructure issues. You, it wasn't a big topic. I, I think we need to address that in Atlanta and Tallahassee. If we have issues like this right here, we need to get it fixed. Because it's it's not just protecting what you guys are doing about Austin, like you said, it doesn't stop at the state line. It really does affect us, and, and it sounds like to me most of the sewage that you're having running out into the, the creeks and streams is really storm runoff. Is that is yeah. that really mainly what the flow is? It is. It's mainly storm water from the creeks and the rivers and flood conditions from folks' property that they're trying to minimize the effect of flooding and you know, their personal property. So most of it. Well, I, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you coming here, too. And uh, we're not here to shoot the messenger by any means. And I hope they gave you a lot of paper. Yeah. Thank you. Are you a little man on the photo post? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're to have that job. But I, I appreciate what you do. Yes, Thank we you. do. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Madam Chairman, I do.